Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the uh, right in the middle of October, October 16th, um, and in the middle of uh, Connected Educators Month. Uh, we, one of the, when we were in Christine Cantrell and Karen Festpower, um, and I kind of brainstormed some ideas, we said, you know, uh, one, of, one of the things we really have to do is teach your voice and getting uh, some, some encouraging people to get their voice out there and, and talking about the issues around um, telling stories and getting into policy issues and other things that are going to come up here tonight. Um, and, and how tricky and risky and wonderful and necessary all of that is. Um, and so we invited some people and um, looks like a, a great conversation. I always like to think that um, I'd love to have dinner with these people. Um, so that's a, sort of what we're doing here tonight. Um, and, and I'm just going to go to my right next to me. Minu, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of put yourself in the context of the question of teacher voice and getting voice out there a little bit? But tell us who you are, what you do. Sure. Um, thanks for thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is Minu Rami. I teach my students English at the Science Leadership Academy here in Philadelphia. Um, and I I think of um, finding my teacher voice really through the National Writing Project. After doing the Summer Institute, um, I really started thinking and and writing about my practice in the classroom. Um, uh, more, more with the public um, eyes on on those those things, um, and um, I I think it has really transformed my practice um, over the years. So um, I'm really happy to be here tonight, and um, I look forward to the conversation that we'll have. Mary Beth, welcome yeah. back. Hi. Introduce yourself, Mary Beth, if you don't mind. Sure. I'm a New York City teacher. I'm starting my 11th year. Um, I was all about my classroom and and not really at all engaged in the larger discussion of education and certainly not education policy until my name was published in the newspaper as one of the more effective teachers in New York City a few years ago, and that really annoyed the hell out of me that we would rank teachers and then publish their names. And uh, and kind of from there on, I've been very much focused on education policy. And I've gotten people at my school uh, engaged in things like pro protesting at, in Albany. And I blog under not my own name for, as I think Paul alluded to, maybe sometimes some fear and intimidation around um, sharing your stories of what are the ramifications of sharing what actually happens in school compared to what people think happens in school. Um, and so I have a blogging personality, which I won't uh, divulge here, but it's, it's you know, well known. I have several thousand followers online, and um, I attend rallies, and I'm invited to conferences to speak under my real name, obviously not my, um, my web personality. That's it. Super. Um, and and I, I hope we can explore some tonight that space between getting public about our practice and moving into policy. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's sort of what's an interesting question, it seems to me. Kevin Hodgson, uh, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I, um, I teach sixth grade in uh, a small uh, suburban community in western Massachusetts. Um, and I came into teaching after 10 years as a newspaper journalist. Um, so uh, in the number past few years with our writing project, the Western Mass Writing Project, we've been working to form partnerships with our local newspapers as a way to get our teacher voices really out there and published on the pages. And, you know, I guess we'll talk about this, but we see it as a way to kind of balance um, some of the headline news, particularly in the last few years that we've seen, that really seem to have hammered us as teachers uh, in general, in education in particular, um, in a way to kind of bring bring a light to our classrooms and what we're doing with our students uh, in a positive way. So uh, we can probably talk more about that a little bit later. But it's great to be here with all of you. Cool. Karen, do you want to check in? <laughs> sure. I'm Karen Fassenpower, and I'm with Borderlands Writing Project, and. 
I'm mostly here to be a relay between our two chat spaces, um, but I'm I'm really um, think teacher voice is incredibly important. It's something I'm really interested in, and I really enjoyed the previous two TTT shows. So I'm looking forward to tonight and hanging out with everybody. Thanks, Joe. Hey, uh, Joe Paraiso. Uh, I teach English, senior English, over in Oakland at Fremont High. Um, teacher voice currently is all coming through my students uh, right now. Like everything they're blogging, um, everything they're researching uh, in terms of what's important to me is it also important to them right now. And it just feels good that a lot of the questions they're asking are um, questions I would ask anyway. But it's coming through the through the lens of a, of the youth, so there's that part. But I do see myself dabbling more into the the technology policy and and the resourcing that we have uh, here in Oakland so I don't even know what that means yet but I mean th there's a there's a huge equity gap uh, in terms of who has what um, which I think is classic for many districts but 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 being but learning through this through TTT learning through all these um, networks that that it's we have to demand the resource and 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 how do I go about doing that I'm just kind of looking at what's working. So this is a great space to see examples. Can you mention what how, how Friday went as well? <laughs> Friday. Friday went great. Um, so what he's talking about is that uh, I led a one-hour uh, PD with my staff. There's about 60 of them. And um, everybody's in different spaces with technology, Everybody's but everybody's talking about the limitation of resource. And, and it basically was a time for me to talk about the evolution of of me as, as one teacher that had to work with the limited resource and what that meant and how it was a long process to get there and I and being able to show samples of what the students are doing uh, people were very surprised that this is this was coming from our kids um, and of course ironically while everyone's trying to get onto the Google Drive that uh, I had created with all these resources you know we had a third of the teachers <laughs> that couldn't log on for whatever reason with our district network stuff so it was just it was hilarious and a learning experience all in one, um, but it did get a lot of people very interested in youth voices, but also how to create their own class websites because I shared that part of my teaching too. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, it went great. Cool, great. And Chad, welcome. hey, good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chad Sansing, and I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade language arts in the micropolitan city of uh, Stanton, Virginia, and you're teaching I don't know, I have a lot of tonight. So gonna talk. Never heard oh, that word. There you go. Yeah, all right. Mike Paulton. I love it. It's on the website somewhere. I saw it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm very interested in, in teacher voice. Having moved between two divisions, um, I'm actually not only approaching going back to a larger school in a different way than I did early in my career, but even then even differently than I did early on in, say, my blogging or, or writing or commenting. And I'm trying all at once to learn the kids and figure out how to bring what I've learned to, to them in a different setting, which I think will be good to write about once I have uh, any of that figured out. But I'm also really interested in, in listening and, and learning the system again and having small conversations with colleagues about little tiny things and as small as how to make a... LED light up with a watch battery, which was a great conversation I had with all kinds of folks today. Um, and I'm also kind of figuring out how what to talk about. I feel like many of the things about which I've been passionate um, are, are actually, uh, not nationally, not systemically, but in, in pretty good hands in all kinds of different pockets all around the country. So I'm kind of like a, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I've got a soapbox, but I'm not sure what, what, to, what to do with it or to pack it up and being between two divisions is interesting because the things I, I do want to talk about are kind of on the back burner right now because I don't want uh, either division to think or anyone in them to think I'm talking specifically about an experience here, there, or anywhere. Uh, these are just thoughts that I have these days. So Check. thinking about where all the fits and how it goes. A little clarity on what you mean by two divisions. What? Sure. So uh, for the first 12 years of my career, I taught for Almoral County Public Schools in Central Virginia. And this year, I'm starting in Stanton City Schools in Shenandoah Valley, mm -hmm. and which is still Central Virginia. And where you were before, at least, um, maybe it's just the way you approached it, but it seemed like you could do whatever you imagined you wanted to do. 
um, almost. And is it less like that now, or? No, I think that's kind of, uh, I'm holding on to that as my theory of action. I've got really wonderful colleagues and administrators and all kinds of ideas, and it's a matter of kind of learning how to do them in a larger place and in a new place. Um, but uh, the, the, little, the little things that I like to try, you know, all the little experiments are, are ongoing and, and happening, and that's it's a lot of fun. And Karen, let's check in right away with um, who's in the chat room and uh, any any quick thoughts there yet, or should we just throw it back open here? There are several people in the chat room, and there are, we're just Getting mostly started. saying hi and nothing. But if anybody's cool. in there and wants to join the hangout, there's room. Exactly right. So um, I want to come back to uh, Minu for a second and. On Monday, can you break down a little bit about what's going on in Philadelphia? And you guys had uh, on Ink Chat on Monday, I think, right? You had a conversation. Can you represent that a little bit? And then um, we'll keep this going here. Please, you know, let's have a real sure. conversation. Open it up. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so... <clears throat> following um, the news out of Philadelphia at all, um, we are in a massive um, budget crisis. Um, upwards of millions of dollars um, had to be cut. Um, teachers have been laid off. Um, there's a very uh, difficult uh, exchange going on between the district and the union. And remains of the quality of education provided to students of Philadelphia. Um, there are schools without full-time counselors. Um, we've lost librarians. There is shortage of teachers. Um, the basic things that make experience worthwhile for the students um, is basically not being provided. Um, the governor today released $45 million that he was holding on to um, after a very fortunate event where a, a child actually passed away um, because there was there was uh, immediate medical attention not provided at, at one of our elementary schools. So, um, I mean, if you want to learn more, please you know, uh, I'll do some of the things that are happening in Philadelphia right now. Dan and Randy Weingarten have been writing and blogging and tweeting about this extensively. Um, and on Monday, um, and I, I, I had hoped that the conversation would go more in this direction, but every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, using the hashtag in chat, English teachers from around the country are coming together. Is, um, and their inquiries about teaching of English. Um, in social justice education, um, while we focus what that means um, in our practice and as it relates to student experience, I wish we had brought in the conversation around educational uh, equity as a whole. Um, I think just we just I think we went with the conversation where teachers were taking it, so it didn't it didn't get to that. But um, uh, Larissa Pahoma, who hosted the chat, and I had really originally hoped that we would we would be able to talk more local issues going on here in Philadelphia. Um, but it was still a, a great conversation, and um, on on Monday night. Um, hundreds of uh, teachers participated and, and had a robust discussion about what it means to to have a social justice curriculum in place and what are some of the challenges of, of figuring that out in your actual practice in the film. Paul, I'm, uh, was, was that enough background? And I think so, yeah. And so let's before. jump in. And, and if other people are hearing themes as we introduce these um, ourselves, um, why don't we? Why don't I just ask that? What themes are you hearing, and where can we go with this conversation? Can I jump in right. for a second? Go ahead, Kevin. Yep. Yeah. So one of the things that I kind of think about as I'm listening to kind of all of us introduce ourselves, and and I blog as well, 
um, is the question of how to uh, kind of move our audience beyond just like teachers as our audience and kind of the general public and pull them in to those kind of conversations. And I'm just thinking of like, um, you know, Twitter chats and other things like that and, uh, you know, strategies we should be thinking about to have, um, you know, parents and community members as part of those discussions too. And I'm not quite sure how to go about that because I think we kind of connect with people that we're familiar with in a way and our network kind of expands out from there. But, you know, how do we make that next jump out, I guess, and, and kind of make that happen? <clears throat> Do you have any ideas? <laughs> My silence is an encouragement for I, you. To I, talk I think about. one of the ways. To, <laughs> okay. I think I think one of the ways to actually broaden the conversation is um, students and voice in this conversation. And um, in Philadelphia, on the ground. Um, Philadelphia Student Union and, and many of the other local Philadelphia student groups have really taken the lead um, uh, during the last academic year. Um, they had walkouts, um, they've been very visible at public protests, um, they've had you know a high level meeting uh, with, with the players um, in charge and I, I think they've done a, a, a tremendous job of, of um, showing not only not only the district leadership or the union leadership, but, but their own parents and their neighbors and and everyday Philadelphia citizen who might not even have a child in this in the school system that they are taking stock in their own education and they are really concerned about um, what's happening to it. Um, so I, I, I'm always looking for ways um, to to bring student voice because ultimately these are not theoretical issues. These issues are impacting my kids and um, I want to hear from them and what they want to do about it. Hmm. I, I I'm just thinking... In... Okay. Was that Mary Beth? No. Well, no. Go ahead, Kevin. Well, I was thinking, uh, um, I mean, that, that's, that's so true. You want to bring the student voices in and then see where it aligns with teacher voice, too, right? Um, I was just curious, Mary Beth, if you would, I'm just thinking of how you, um, your identity as the blogger is different <laughs> than your identity as Mary Beth here. And um, I don't know if you'd be willing to kind of talk about what went into that and, you know, why that seems important. I'm sure you get asked that a lot, but I think it's important when we're talking about teacher voice, like there is this debate of do I do I have a pseudonym, do I hide behind, you know, something so I can have a stronger voice or do I say who I am and that's my voice and run into problems, you know, and where that balances in this kind of world of, of uh, you know, digital identities. Um, thanks for asking that. Um, I think you lose to assume an identity, you gain something and you lose something. So uh, the anonymity permits you to say things without necessarily without ramifications immediate. So when I I write under two identities, one of which is like my authentic classroom self and what happens, where I don't mention my students' names, but I mention things that happen. Uh, snafus, DOE, bungles, um, my feelings as an educator, which are sometimes mixed and they're evolving, and um, I think that's as close to me as you're going to see, but I don't want my principal to, to have her dawn on her that it's her that she's read about or, or anyone else. Um, and maybe and it's, I, what, what age do you teach again? Can middle you school. Notice? It is middle school, school, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Hmm. Um, and then I also blog under an identity in the way that a Stephen Colbert is on television. That's I kind of blog in that way, okay? And so using that voice, you don't get to like the kernel of who I am as a teacher or my daily in and outs, but it's more a satirical look at how fucked up education is in America. And um, 
when I blog under that persona, I take on national issues. So that's even why I'm informed about what's going on in Philadelphia or why I know what's happening in Chicago or why I know that English teacher, uh, teachers in England are walking out. And it's because of that other identity. Whereas the my, my first identity is just what's happening in my room. And it's almost like uh, if I were to go out for a drink with you on a Friday and I sat there and maybe I cry into my beer, that's what that what the primary identity is. And then the second one is very sarcastic, satirical. And it's uh, and I have to say I feel like I lose authenticity under both uh, pseudonyms because people don't necessarily um, connect with you without your name. If that's kind of interesting given all the anonymity on the web. But, yeah. Um, even using your own name, you can pretend to be something else or different than you are. But um, I have a lot of respect for the people who use their own names because uh, they're really putting themselves out there. I don't feel that comfortable yet. So you, you've really captured the question that I asked right at the beginning, like uh, those two personalities. And is it is it like... Should, should we look toward integrating uh, in general, or, or, or is it okay to keep these separate in that way? Uh, well, my, you know, the satirical voice should really not meet the other human. I don't, I don't think <laughs> any more than Dr. Jekyll should meet Mr. Hyde. But, um, but I will say that, um, you know, I, much like my students, you know, I'm a work in progress, and there might be some time in which I would feel free to come out as who I am. But when I talk about issues I'm having with my students, I don't use their names. And if I used my name, then their mm -hmm. anonymity would be disclosed, and I don't want to do that. Or if they ever caught on, like my, some of my kids have said to me, I Googled you, Mrs. Whitehouse, and I saw that you're la la la, and you were in the New York Times. And the, so I don't need them to accidentally come across my blog and then say, hey, that story's about me. I didn't know she felt that way about me. Whether it was right or wrong, I wouldn't want them to like, have a sense that it was them. Hmm. And then, you know, there's a lot of things that happen at school that I've written about. And uh, it's almost like dialing 311, which I have done on my school because my school has engaged in practices which are illegal, immoral. Um, and I, when I say my school, at the highest level, things have occurred that you're like, really, that should not happen. And if you confront them, then you're on the list, and then suddenly your evaluation is unsatisfactory, or you end up with yard duty 85 days in a row, or whatever, whatever petty means they have of making your life miserable will come to bear. And... Uh, and then I, I just don't, I'm not willing to put myself out there. So like dialing 311, I put out the information about what's happening. And a lot of people will say, oh my god, that's the exact same thing that happens at my school. And just by sharing that information, you can see organizations like in New York City, one of the, one of the union parties is called MORE, uh, Movement of Rank and File Educators. And they've taken up a bunch of stuff that they've read about or Unity has done it, or Action has done it, where they read the blogs about what teachers are talking about, and sometimes they'll give you solutions. Have you contacted this? Have you contacted that? All without sacrificing your anonymity. There is power in coming out, and many times I feel like a coward for not doing so. I mean, you're supposed to be your student's advocate, but on the other hand, how many times can I face the guillotine myself? Chad or Joe, any thoughts? Um, I, I have two two things. One about the 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 I guess putting the two personalities and splitting them. I mean, it kind of speaks to what we say with our students that because they're young in the game of of what their profiles mean on the web, and I and I do know that they see a lot of value in having an academic self, and that's a very different voice they speak through, and then their social self. Um, very different voice from the academic self. Um, and then this emerging kind of professional self where they're, um, it's, it's very interesting how they are able to, they actually see it as they're not losing any aspect of their identity, but they're more so affirming 
you know, they're developing identity in each area. So there's that part. And then it, it makes me, actually, it just, it really makes me uh, sad, Mary Beth. Like, I feel like in Oakland, we, we, people, we've been complaining a lot about everything, but it just, I guess we've, we've gotten to the point where we'll complain openly and not openly because for a long time you just felt like nobody was listening anyway. Um, so... I don't know, you kind of give you free reign to say whatever you want because we're not getting what we want anyway, um, which is sad. So I, I do see that a lot of, a lot of uh, the power of the, of the student voice, which um, I know, Mino, you were saying that, that the kids really got involved with the movement and, and the city was able to, Philly was able to see what, what, that the kids knew about everything that was going on, and, and I'm really encouraged to hear that um, because... This is why we're trying to push our students' voice out there. This is why getting the kids on the blogs and just teaching them the tools is so important. Um, I would love to have them read what your students have put out um, about what's going on. So, Absolutely. We'll, we'll exchange emails and Please. connect them. Yeah. So uh, it's probably no accident that the two high school teachers here are are like are bringing up student voice, right? Because I think it might be different <laughs> in middle school, and so age mm. has some impact on on you know how, how I don't know the nature of student voice in some way. Mm. But any reflections yeah. on that? Well, I, I think, mean, I oh go ahead, go ahead Chad, yeah. No, that's all right. Go ahead, Joe. Um, no, I just forgot. Go ahead. All good. Okay, sure. Now senior moment. Well, you know, like, part of it is, um, I, you know, it's, it's a perfect storm of things. If you are facing the pressure of testing in your, in your curriculum, like, when you, you have to make extraordinary efforts, I feel, sometimes, uh, to provide authentic opportunities for students to write and to publish. And many of the things, like, you know, I, I'd like to write about testing more, but I feel like writing about testing more would be me giving away my license back to the state because the things I want to talk about are very often the things that, you know, I'm complicit in signing. I won't talk about this each thing. So there's a, there's a weird thing there for me in helping students figure that out. Part of it is policy. Um, how do you get around, you know, COPPA? Not that you would want to get around it, but like how do you, what's the new deal, so to speak, for younger students using social media and, and finding ways to authentically voice themselves outside of the classroom? That's something that I think needs more unpacking. And then part of it, um, my wife and I have been talking about this, colleagues and I have been talking about this, this might be something that I... I break out of my kind of self-imposed writing hermitness soon to write about. You know, I, I was talking with my students this week, and I was like, so, you know, what else? Some of these days are just rocking. Some of these days trying other things that don't work so well. And our, you know, our responses are kind of profoundly different to those things. It's our middle ground, et cetera. Like, you know, how can we, what's the, where's the place where we, we kind of buy in and try something and, it's not a big deal if it doesn't work. It doesn't have to be a big deal. We don't have to worry about failure, things like that. And the conversation came around to um, expecting to be told what to do or expecting to be bossed or expecting to be, you know, like handed the next set of orders of something to do. And it was kind of, it was kind of fascinating. So I, I don't know that students are, by the time I, I see some of my students, they're kind of, conditioned to think that there's not an opportunity for it or that the, the outlet is, you know, resistant. And then you get into patterns of power struggle inside schools too. So I'm all for student voice and trying to figure so, out ways to make it count and to make, like, stuff real to kids. Um, but it's an ongoing you know, it's an ongoing experiment in how to do that in middle school, I think. So the word narrative jumps to mind, um, and it's and it seems to me that I mean because when when I think about my students and given what you were just talking about there, Chad, um, I I wish I could have like an X-ray machine that looks inside their head and that says like what is the narrative of school that you're bringing with you, 
No, because that's not my narrative, and you're playing out this other game over here, and it's not the narrative that I think we should be doing. But I also probably think that's true with politicians and parents and others. Like, we all have these different stories about what school does. Mm -hmm. um, so there, just so that, that word feels like an, an interesting one to think about because it's, it's a way to bridge between just not just but telling our stories and policy in some way. Any thoughts on that? Those notions? Oh, yeah, I think well, that's, it's that's definitely. A, I was just going to say that's. I mean, that's a really good point. That uh, you know, that depending on where you're coming from, your kind of narrative of what education is and for is can be very different. And sometimes those um, those ideas collide, um, and sometimes they kind of mesh together and. It's almost like you have to figure out where those, you know, alliances are that you can kind of, you know, you can pull together and and make positive change or make a positive, um, you know, stand on something. And maybe it's with students, maybe it's with families, maybe sometimes it's with those politicians too that are with you. But we lump them into politicians, so therefore we think in all they see us are, you know, they need more testing and they need to be, um, you know, evaluated. Um, but there are plenty of people. Who are in power that um, don't necessarily believe that, but you know where are they and how do we find them? And that's part of that idea of, uh, you know, we're talking about teacher voice and connecting and you know making those connections more visible. Kevin, can you, do you want to keep talking a little bit about and explain the newspaper project and how long it's been going on and sure where it's going to go and yeah. Yeah, so and how we fits this this conversation too. But yeah. Sure. So our writing project, um, I would say, for about five years now, um, has and there was a downtime because one. This is between two different newspapers, so one kind of dropped us when they cut a lot of staff, um, and then we found another partnership. Uh, but basically, it tries to connect teachers with. Um, the news, our local newspapers, um, is a way to provide teacher columns, educational columns, um, about what's going on in the classroom. And you know, we see it as a way to get uh, teachers writing and teachers published and their voice out into the, uh, you know, the public with parents and policymakers and the general public as well, um, in a, as positive a light as we can. Um, and so far, it's been really well received. And I, you know, I think that. Um, part of so I, I've been one of the facilitators of finding teachers and then connecting them with the newspaper um, and kind of working in between there is um, you know first of all teachers I think need to be asked to do that like some teachers would naturally write for a newspaper but a lot of them just like you know just like this show Paul right where you have to kind of you know it's an honor to be asked on here well, teachers feel honored to be asked to write about their practice too, and um, and so we're trying to make that a little easier for the newspaper and for the teachers as well. Um, and uh, we do get some teachers who worry sometimes about what their administrators will say about them being published in the paper, um, and you know those are kind of interesting conversations. Of you know, here it can only be good because you know you're right you're they're kind of writing about the great things that are happening in their classroom at their school and um, and the kind of feedback they get from their principals and from the community has been really positive. Um, but it, it takes some hand-holding too, um, which as a writing project I think is perfectly in sync for that because you know we are connected with a lot of teachers who are doing amazing things and we want to kind of share out that knowledge with other teachers and the general public as well. So this is a monthly column um, that mm -hmm. runs once a month in the in the newspaper's education. They have a monthly education section. Um, yeah. So how do you deal with um, or? I I want to I want to echo ahead. what Kevin just said. Go ahead, Mino. Go ahead. Mm, maybe she's delayed. You are. Go ahead, Mino. Um, I I just want I just want to say that. What Kevin said resonates with what Kevin just with me um, very personally. If it wasn't for the National Writing Project and the Philadelphia Writing Project and people like Paul O and looked at what I was doing, 
um, in my class as something worth writing about, something worth talking about, something worth sharing about. And I think it's so important that teachers are asked share their ideas. Um, and it really does feel like an honor when, uh, when you're being asked to do that. Gives you a new set of eyes to look at your practice with. So um, I, I just want to say personally what Kevin said makes a lot of sense to me. I want to echo uh, what both, both said because the the part where the National Writing Project came in and and, came, and told my all my students that what they were doing was big and that what they were doing was rare. Um, I had no. I thought I thought we were behind in in our kids getting their voice out there. I, I really did. I felt like um, that we were playing catch up, and then to hear from from Paul that you know your students, this 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 what they're doing is actually big work. Um, that was an honor. Like that just felt so good to have my kids be featured like that. Um, and then being at it was that lens that Mean is talking about is 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 true. Like now everything I do, I feel like not that I feel like I'm being watched, but. I feel like there's opportunities for people to critique my practice <laughs> that I never had before. Um, so, yeah, I, that's where I'm at right now with 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 how I think my practice or what it did for my classroom. Like two years ago, the classroom did not look like this. It looks vastly different this year. So. Hmm. It sounds like the audience plays a role in all our messages across here. Like who our audience is and. How are we trying to expand that audience, and what message are we trying to, um, you know, it's it. I guess you know it's a PR, you know, in a lot of ways. I think we're trying to change. You know, Paul talked about the narrative. We're trying to change the national narrative around what education is, and it, it's difficult, uh, and it takes a lot of people to, you know, to bring a positive view as well as on. And I think there's this value in both, and maybe. You know, Mary Beth is talking about these competing voices, to, you know, that she has. That's part of that too. Is that, um, of uh, you know, um, of all the good things that she sees in the schools, that you know, she needs another blog, Mary Beth. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, the, but but those kind of stories are really important, I think. I don't know so, if I could do happy news. <laughs> Not necessarily. So, uh, talk about that. But, so let's talk about that a little bit then. So. Um, your column, Kevin, is is well. Mary Beth just said happy news. It's <laughs> ma it is mainly happy news, um, but yes. with a different. With but teachers have a different audience, so that's interesting. Um, so, <laughs> again, it just feels to me like, yes, uh, Joe's classroom is different than it was two years ago, and you know we're doing a lot of us are doing amazing things yet. Um, you know, testing is getting worse. The, the way teachers are getting, you know, pushed around is worse than it's ever been. You know, so I didn't, like like all of our telling our stories and getting our voices out there isn't having a lot of impact, it doesn't <laughs> seem to me, on the way policies are happening. <laughs> well, that's because we don't have the rich relative bankrolling our uh, public relations effort, Paul. Mm -hmm. and that's part <laughs> of it is that, you know, when you have... When you have the you know the millionaires billionaires who are funding well-run campaigns, you know that are targeting teachers and education, it's hard to it's hard to you know hold up against that. Or am I wrong? I don't know. That's how it feels to me. Oh, well, I don't think you're wrong. I think that um, so-called philanthropy is having a huge impact, and what it's doing is co-opting the democratic process. So that people who literally come in with billions of dollars are driving policy. They have no more educational experience than their 18 years in, you know, school, um, and and they're the ones who, because of their cash, they will fund research to say what it wants, what they want to. Then they'll publicize the research. Then they'll fund the lobbyists to get the politicians to change the rules. You know, if you follow like the Common Core, where that came from and who funded it. It should be called, you know, Bill Gates state standards, not Common Core. So, mm -hmm. and and I don't think people know that. I don't think people understand. And if, you know, when recent polls come out, 
parents don't even know what the Common Core is, never mind, you know, teachers who are still at a loss in figuring it out. And, and the idea of Common Core isn't necessarily a bad one, but the way it's being handed down with punitive measures, see, now you're hearing one of my voices come out, is that uh, it's, <laughs> it's a very powerful weapon in, uh, in, reformist, um, in, in the reformist bank. So, Chad, can, can I ask you to address the question that I asked, sort of asked earlier? Like, I mean, you talked about passions, and there are amazing things happening, you know, all over the country, different places around things that you're passionate about. Yet, you know, schools haven't necessarily aren't necessarily going in the right direction to keep those passions alive. Is that a fair worry, at least? <laughs> yeah. No. I mean. The should always be worried about the system, um, <laughs> right? I mean, like it's not. But as as you know, we've we've talked about this in the context of things like walkout, walk on, and other things before. Um, the system's ability to change or to do something different is, uh, you know, woefully small if existent. And the, the real potential for that rests with the people. And all across the country in different places, like trying something different requires different kinds of, of sacrifices. There are different kinds of obstacles. And as people have said, you know, one of the things that the writing project and organizations like it have done is help people find a voice, find ways to articulate what they're doing, share those out, have people network and support that. And that's, you know, that's what I see kind of continuing to, to grow and the conversations becoming a little bit wider and uh, bringing in a little bit, uh, some more people and, and trying new things. Um, you know, I can't, I can't imagine or, or speak to what it's like to teach in some of the divisions and districts and cities around the country that are just, you know, from, from the outside, uh, it's, it's daunting and baffling to try to think about what's happening in those places. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hopeful that people in situations like mine can find ways to do stuff and you know, it can be called subversive or whatever or it can just be called trying things out. Um, mm -hmm. I had a conversation today about how, you know, how, how and why and when do you like connect things to a content area like language arts or is the trick really to explode content areas like language arts into to everything? Um, I like those conversations. I like them whenever they happen. But I, I see how different they turn out, how differently they turn out uh, in different places in the country. And uh, I think it's a responsibility of you know, people like me in my position. I was able to switch divisions and still continue trying some of the things I'm trying. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the least I can do for what other people are going through right now. So, Mary Beth, could, could, um, you uh, started organizing and getting, they didn't, we didn't get uh, connected tonight, but we may in the near future. Um, with people, uh, people from Chicago, uh, somebody from New Jersey, yep. you, you have, um, through your voice, um, a larger network, and it seems like a union-connected network, is that true? Um, Can I, mean, you well, I, I guess, you know, it's really hard to find teachers who aren't unionized. There certainly are plenty, but because so many teachers get their health care and other benefits through unions, you know, it's mm -hmm. a very powerful force. Um, also, typically union members will speak up for their rights more readily than non-union members. So when you're on, you know, the web, uh, whatever social media organization you're we're talking through, a lot of people share their um, very strong opinions. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't, <laughs> when I tell you, like, it's such um, an evolution as to who I am as a teacher and my participation is now nationwide. I get invited to things. Will you come down to Alabama? We're walking across a bridge. Will you come here where, you know, we're giving a conference on this and we need someone to talk about? And I'm not even... I'm nothing compared to you know my heroes in the movement like 
people who are so well informed, people who write about it, people who have a voice on college campuses as well as, you know, in their classroom. I've got people in Chicago. You know, you get very attached to people. Not having never met people, when you finally come in contact with them at a joint event that you're protesting at or something, I barely recognize people because I only see their tiny little, you know, one by one picture, like I'm seeing you guys right now. Um, but you, you have a real affection for people who are one sharing information with you, so they're making me more informed. And two, sometimes we like give each other little comments, like you know, keep your chin up or hang in there. We write about what the mayor said, da da da. Um, and and then it just grows from there. So I was I chatting with um, me, me know about uh, Helen Jim, who's a big voice out of Philadelphia. And I've never met the woman, and yet I feel like you know, like I've had a beer with her, that sort of thing. And um, there's Michelle Gunderson and Diane Ravitch, who I don't know what that woman does because she is social media, you know, all the time. And she's seventy something years old. And so here I am in my fifties, and I'm suddenly engaging. My daughter laughs when I tell her, you know, oh my Twitter account, oh my Twitter followers. She's like, how old are you? Like, <laughs> but that's part of being a teacher, evolving, getting comfortable with new technology, leading the way, and getting the, your voice out there. And and so, and, and then how else can I convince my colleagues? If Look, if my old self can do it, then your little 30-something self should be able to do it. And I think that's a really good model for, for um, my colleagues. Yeah, but yeah, I, I got to say, I was going to say earlier, so there are lots of thoughts, and, but the, uh, that I find young teacher, teachers more afraid of all the measures of student accountability that are going to be attached to their careers than I am because, you know, I'm like, you know, this too will pass. But <laughs> it's how I kind of feel. But do, do you find that also that young teachers are kind of a little cowed by all of this? I don't know what the word is. But I also I also love that you said the movement. And I'd like you, I, that's more important, I think. Um, if uh, Minu, maybe you could, and, and others, like what is the movement? Um, I'm glad to hear there is one. <laughs> yeah. Could I, I'd like to say something yeah. just really quickly in response yeah. to what you said. And, um, uh, you know, like every day I wake up and I'm kind of amazed that I'm teaching kids that are born later and later in, in the timeline. <laughs> my yes. Right? yes. But I also work <laughs> with lots of people who have never taught outside of a high stakes testing environment. Right. And they've got some fantastic ideas and implementing things and kind of shaping things for kids and experiences that are, are, are great and you know the kind of the dark punchline is always and it aligns to you know like <laughs> it's never just enough to to teach to learn and, and so I, it's not that I, I think young teachers are incapable of thinking of these things but uh, as, I, as I look around sometimes you know there's not context like I had maybe a year before I gave my first pilot standardized test and then after that, they started coming out every year. So, you know, I feel, I, I don't know what we would call the generations of teachers, but, um, you know, I came in right at the end of one thing, the beginning of another, and there are lots of people now who I don't think I've ever taught otherwise, which is good to bear in mind. Um. I did want to check, Karen, anything to add from the chat room, or <laughs> or should we just keep going here? Well, there's a lot of great conversations going on in the chat room. Um, we, we had a conversation about sort of the whole dual identity question and whether with students and with teachers, where does that come from? Is this something to be encouraged or discouraged or you know, trust issues and all that. And then I just want to read um, a comment from Christina, who is sorry she can't be in the Hangout because she, she has great thoughts on this. But how do we take back a narrative around innovation, around our vision of teaching and learning? I guess I keep wondering the role of this in the midst of also essential organizing, marching, calling, budget watching, etc. And I think that taking back the narrative, you know, it fits into the whole conversation about what Kevin raised about needing a PR campaign and the whole sort of that money is driving all this and it's you know 
it's at the core of a lot of this, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have about five minutes left. So I, I, I do want to, Mary Beth, if you could start, and then others add, what is the movement, and how, where do we sign up? <laughs> so um, the the movement. Um, exists you did say that, didn't you? I did. <laughs> and, okay. and that, I mean, you know, when you look back on history, uh, and I, and I teach history once in a while, is that um, you'll say the civil rights movement. And what does that mean? Well, there was national organization, but there were also lots of local things going on, which then get brought under the larger umbrella umbrella when you start to look backwards. Um, and so I think there are lots of individual things happening now, which when you have a historical perspective will be all brought under the big umbrella with that backward glance. But at the moment, what's happening is small things are gathering momentum. And a lot of it's being gathered... Uh, under the auspices of people like Diane Ravitch and Anthony Cody, Michelle Gunderson out of Chicago, Karen Lewis. Um, but I would say she is different from other union leaders because she's very... You think Randy Weingartner is controversial? Then you need to like listen to Karen Lewis because she, Randy's nothing compared to what's going on with uh, Karen. And, and it's also because they've taken a lot more crap so Chicago, like Philly, you know, has been having 50 schools closed at a time. And so it's led to more controversial leadership. Um, but not necessarily, when I say controversial, that doesn't mean wrong-headed. You know, it's, it's just uh, their methods are um, different than what you would expect. So the is, it, is it teacher voice, by the way? Uh, mm -hmm. Karen Lewis was a teacher for many years, unlike mm -hmm. some people who are, like, in the classroom for two years just to get, like, politically placed. Mm -hmm. And then they get moved through, you know, the union up to where they were all suppo supposed to be. But they just have a little classroom experience to get that credibility, their street cred, as my kids would say. But in fact, they haven't earned it over 30 years, like someone else has. Yeah, yeah. So um, if you, there's like a network for public educators that was started. Um, there's when you go on social media and you Google like Education Nation, which it's kind of been co-opted out of NBC because a lot of people were annoyed that teachers weren't even invited. NB Education Nature went under a transformation. Now, they didn't even have, like, real classroom teachers there for a lot of years. Now they had Jesse Hagopian on, who I know was once a guest on your show, Paul. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, he's uh, traveling. We invited him tonight. But yeah. Right, and, and so he's one of the people leading the movement, and... And it's picking up. But Diane Ravage thinks, like, it was turning the corner, like, that... But kind of, I kind of with Kevin, which is, you know, there's so much money on the other side, and you feel if ever there were a lot of little Davids around the planet, that's what we are because Samson has all the money and maybe the rocks too. I don't know what else he's got. To have. So, can I get others to address then? Once we turn the corner, what's that change going to look like? <laughs> if, and if that's too hard to do in two minutes, but if you can. <laughs> Um, seriously, because then, then, I mean, and one thing I strongly believe is being the change you want to see, right? Doing the change right now. Um, but I, I'll, I'll throw that out there, and then just we'll just go around and get final thoughts from each of you. How about that? <laughs> More openly. Chad, do you want to jump in? Yeah, so, you know, there are any any number of great comic books out there about the <laughs> eternal battle between chaos and control, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, and most of what, you know, my interpretation is just, you know, control. Control, control, control. The need for control, the holding on to that, whether it's at the micro level or the macro level. Uh, it's just driving way too much. And there's no space for kind of authentic learning when it's assumed that you're you're going to school to fulfill somebody else's plan or agenda or follow their pace or their map. And so for me, you know, I think of the many things that I perhaps said too stridently or at the wrong time, uh, I think one of the ideas from the beginnings of my blog was something to hold on to. And, you know, just the idea that where, wherever you are, uh, all that you can do is what you should do. And very often that, that'll not be as much as you wish but with some consideration, it'll be more than you think. Joe? Um, 
I think what's around the corner is that eventually the students there, they have way more of a voice in shaping their own education. Um, whether that be at the systemic level, uh, the, the school, the district level, the school site level, the classroom level. Um, I, I'm at the point where I'm still in the classroom level, but I see the power it's had over other, influence it's had over other classrooms. So, yeah, I don't know. That's what's around the corner. I'm going to stay hopeful. Mm -hmm. Karen. I'm going to pass right now. Ooh. Kevin? I was thinking we need a Kickstarter campaign, Paul, um, for the movement. Um, you know, uh, I really like what um, what Chad said about um, you know you make you make change in the place that you're in, and 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 also keep a, an eye on the the bigger picture as well. You know, I know we're having this during Connected Educators Month, and I'm always, I'm really conflicted about it in a lot of ways because you know I look at the list of sponsors and. You know, I watched the Twitter list, and it's all the comp. It seems like 80% are the companies peddling their Common Core, you know, stuff under the uh, guise of Connected Educators Month, and and then on the other hand, I'm like, well, maybe we're going to bring some of the teachers into our, you know, our networks that makes the movement right. It's kind of stronger, and you know, I'm I'm torn on it uh, on a lot of things, um, on, on the best approaches. Um, so, um. I don't have any solutions right now. <laughs> Maybe it's too late in the day. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> well, Beth. Uh, and I love what Chandler said. And I love the comic book image. And I would love to envision myself as a hero. But mostly... <clears throat> mostly I feel right on the edge of failure. And that's not good enough for my students. They, you know, there's that horrible movie, Waiting for Superman. They don't just need one Superman. They've got their parents who work really hard. And they've got teachers who, man, I get to school fucking 6 o'clock in the morning, and I don't leave till 5.30 at night, and then I work another four hours when I get home. And I don't have a phone booth to change in. I'm exhausted. And I'm exhausted not just from the everyday grading and conferencing and goal setting and re-goal setting and decorating my room and quality review and school report cards. I'm exhausted because I think about them all the time and what I can do to make up for an inequality that happened long before they got to my classroom. And there's, as Kevin said, there's so many of us trying to fight this good fight, but I just feel really small in the battle. And when I network, whether it's anonymously or here where you know who I am, I feel a little bit stronger because I'm with a lot of other people who are fighting the good fight. Yeah. Thanks, Mary Beth. Me neither. So, I, I think my approach is two-pronged. Um, I think the most radical thing to do is really do the things in your classroom with your students that, that you feel like are the right things, right things to do for them. And then find energy and meaningful connections and useful resources through these types of uh, networks, these types of um, connections. Um, I, I think Mary Beth is right on when she says that um, it's not maybe hope we're lacking, it's energy. And as energy by joining networks by connecting with um, other teachers and and you know finding that uh, that last push to to get me through another stack of papers or another challenge or finding a new way to reach a kid that I'm not reaching in my classroom um, I I think 
if there is such a uh, movement, if there is such a thing as a movement, I, I don't think it happens um, with just individual teachers. I think we have to we have to keep like we are in small pockets around the country and look for ways to bring people into the conversations that are not currently in the conversation. Cool. Well, um, Karen, unless you want to jump back for a second, we'll close, or do you have a final? Yeah. Yeah, just r really quickly, I want to read a comment from Peggy in the chat room that says, Mary Beth, I feel your pain and frustration. Just keep focusing on yourself and your kids. You are an amazing teacher and are making a difference. And I just want to say that to everybody in this room and who's watching. It's, it's hard, but you are making a difference, and a lot of people appreciate that. Well, thank you all um, for coming here. Um, we uh, will be back next Wednesday with another Connected Educator show. Um, we're thinking of doing and uh, talk about energy. Anyway, um, a show about shows like uh, podcasting um, and and so forth. So if we, um, that's what we're right after I get off of this. That's where we'll be talking to other people. So Peggy. Um, <laughs> You're going to get a little note. So it would be really interesting to think about um, like shows like this that do exactly what you were saying, give us some energy at the end. Um, so this one is every Wednesday evening, and um, it, it's broadcast over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. And uh, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier set that up several years ago, and we've been managing to keep going since. Um, thank you all, because of such great people like uh, right here and in the chat room. Thank everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye.